uh, we will start. So I would like to welcome you all to this virtual um, SIB virtual computational biology seminar series. Uh, today we have the pleasure to host uh, Rostislav Kuziakiv, who is a data scientist at the Service and Support for Science IT uh, unit of the University of Zurich, which is also a HPCA core facility of the SIB. So um, Rostik Ern is an MD in uh, Ukraine in 2003, and his PhD in uh, uh, bioinformatics at the University of Geneva in 2013. And in between those two uh, diplomas, uh, Rostik held different positions. So he worked as a medical doctor in Ukraine, a bioinformatician at the University of Toronto, a clinical project manager at the Toronto East General Hospital, and he then, he then decided to move overseas, and he went to Europe, where uh, he became he came back to Europe, where he became researcher at the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics in Geneva, where he, uh, he did his PhD, and uh, he also held the position of a clinical data manager uh, at the Geneva University uh, Hospital. And since 2014, at the uh, S3IT unit in Zurich, where he works now. Hostic participates and supervises local and international uh, projects with a clear focus on data management and bioinformatics application uh, for life science and medicine. So just briefly, the S3IT support, uh, supports the uh, Zurich researcher and research group in using IT to empower their research from consultancy to application support and access to cutting-edge cloud cluster and supercomputing systems. So. Um, Today, um, Rostik will tell us more about the uh, iPhoto, if I'm not wrong, and uh, it's a rep reproducible workflow management system for biomedical data. So thank you again, uh, Rostik, for accepting the, our invitation, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Diana. Thank you very much, Nicola. Thank you very much for coming here. It's a big pleasure to be in Lausanne. It's a pleasure to see familiar faces. So I uh, hope you will find something interesting within this talk and uh, applicable towards the work you've been doing. So uh, uh, before maybe jumping into the hot waters of data reproducibility and data management, uh, I would like to recall back uh, in time and uh, to give you a, a bit of history on uh, the unit how was it created, because that will be the base for your understanding uh, how we ended up into the data reproducibility. So back in 2014, University of Zurich following the demands, the growing demands of the research units, decided to come up with a unit, okay, taking already into account the successful existence of Ethan IT, okay, in Lausanne, and the unit, similar unit uh, in Basel, and to come up with a unit which would be uh, weaponized, okay, tooled with uh, different computational resources, and the unit which would help uh, the scientists with uh, their computational needs. So don't ask me why, but actually due to the administrating discussions and so on, we put, they put a unit uh, within the, along with the Centrale Informatische Unit, the Central Informatics Department, under the Department of Law Economics. So this is uh, something to talk to the Uni Lightroom, uh, but as for now, uh, it's like this. Changes are coming, but uh, within, from this place, we are called to serve all other faculties, from life science, economics, uh, also Swiss veterinary medicine, mathematics, and physics. So creating, by creating this unit, our mission was to combine or to unite certain experts in bioinformatics, data management, software development, okay, and to be a unit which would support researchers with their growing demand on computational resources, as well as provide, in an easy, user-friendly way, services to the same research groups. Also, we were called, depending on, uh, on the people what we have into in the group, uh, to be sort of also an innovative platform for the new developments. For example, one, the people who we been collaborating with Professor Borden, uh, Ben borden Bailey. Okay, so who is working in the 3D imaging and cancer. So uh, one of his software developer was working for him, 
but as we know through the uh, financial resources and then uh, uh, other things, uh, he was relocated within the SVAT. We funded his position, and he was uh, and he continued okay developing of that tool and that methodology. So becoming also turning us into the unit where the research and the development can continue. So along with this, Uni Lightroom and the university granted us with a list of certain services what we have to provide. Definitely, first of all, it would be access to the research IT infrastructure, software development, okay, the specialized data analysis, and as well as consultancy on everything mentioned before. And in addition, we would have to also run the courses like uh, uh, CBIS running courses on unit Linux, uh, sequencing, proteomics, and so on. Uh, definitely, we were not alone. The, we are glad that the Uni Lightroom understood that we cannot do this uh, on our knees. So they weaponized us with certain expensive toys. First of all, they invested almost 15 million Swiss francs into the OpenStack uh, cloud computing system. You will see some numbers. Uh, on what it's all about and uh, what kind of uh, characteristic it has. So this uh, OpenStack was established in the University of Zurich, uh, uh, University of Zurich uh, data center, and each researcher, okay, contributed certain amount, can have an access and generate the computational power what he needs. If you cannot be satisfied with the open cloud solutions, uh, University and our unit offers also you the GPU cluster possibility as well as the Hydra, which is a high memory machine system for your extensive and really uh, powerful computation. So these two, mostly used by the Department of Mathematics, Astronomy, and Physics. If that is not enough for you, we also collaborate with the uh, computer center back in Lugano and upon your request and certain administrative agreements, we can pre-book okay, the time and the resources at the uh, Peace Dance Supercomputer back in Lugano. So with this, okay, now researchers at the University of Zurich, they got the possibility which, were not, which didn't exist before. And they did really give it a really good spin. So uh, the team was growing, as for now you see the our team members, we have uh, cloud computing IT administrators, we have guys doing the front end development, the back end development, running also the Hydra, high performance computing and parallel computing. Three first ones belong to the so called life science team. And the life science team, major responsibilities would be to provide consultancy as well as support on the data management, bioinformatic analysis for genomics and proteomics, as well as customized workflow development and the data visualization. And to do all of those things mentioned before, we used what we call the iPortal, which is a central open stack solution for storage, tracking, analysis, and data visualization. And the iPortal consists of three major bricks. It's the OpenBIST, Singularity, GCP Pi classes, Python classes, and Jupyter. I will talk more in details about this later. So now you've heard the story where it's begin, where it's all began, and now where are we now. But a little bit of story continues since 2014. That was a big start for us. We were mostly hired at that year, and we were accelerating. Our management team were bringing simply really projects on a weekly basis. Right, uh, the trust what our management team had within the scientific community at that moment allowed us to engage and to get funds okay, for those projects. So 2015, we were engaged in many interesting projects covering genomics, proteomics, image processing, biomedical, plus we were doing the biomedical data management. We were getting more data because people been using computational resources available, more calculations, and we were quite happy because first papers appeared and the first reviewers came. And that was the breaking point for us because the engagements in so many projects okay, put us at the age where the reviewers started asking really tough and nasty questions, which we had hard times to answer. So definitely where, first of all, where we have our data, 
row, results, analysis, etc. But the most hardest one, how did you get results? What software you use? What kind of version? Under what parameters? What code? Where is the code? And so on. Finalizing everything, now can we reproduce these results? And uh, we weren't happy campers at that moment. 2015, 2016 breaking, okay, we sit and we had our endless meetings on how it can be done, can you wager? Basically, we were, we were spending sleepless nights because we just have to understand the way we were, we've been working. We were given a project we had to finish within three or six months. And we were pushed to the limits where we had to generate the results as soon as possible because now you have, an, uh, you have tools okay, to do it much faster. You can parallelize, you can scale your code, and you can generate more results in a faster and more efficient way. But you have to remember that we were just PhD students came out of our studies, right? We were concentrated. Before, we did one big project where we ran everything locally, where we had everything stored on the Dropbox or something else. So that was a completely different scale for us. And we struggle. We struggle a lot. So we, as I said, we sit, we started analyzing, and definitely decided, let's take a look and trying to figure it out what's going on. Why do we have those problems? So we started making papers. And this one particularly explaining and showing you that the usage, okay, uh, the appearance of the big data sets or small size, medium size data sets, along with the panels, okay, growing exponentially within, within the coming years. So you have more data, okay, visualized and more data represented in, the, uh, uh, in your papers. Along with that, okay, we started to analyzing hey, what about the what about the usage of the bioinformatic resources? And here's a publication coming from the uh, from the EMBL on the usage of the bioinformatic resources and uh, uh, correlated with the sizes of the data sets. Also, you see a quite big growth. With this one, okay, paper describe uh, how. Uh, the bioinformatic resources, as well as the database usage, was used depending on different domains, like bioinformatics, biology, and other domains. And we see also the growth. That could be explained, and uh, the explanation for this is that we have a quite fast development of the technologies. We have people who are self-educating themselves into the bioinformatics. Plus, we have additional courses, additional trainings, giving them knowledge. So they are not afraid to try new things. They are not uh, eager to wait and sit and someone will do this for them. Okay, plus reduction of the prices for the usage of the resources, make it available to them, and they try, okay, and they started using this. So that was sum up somehow, and all of those big data sets and all of the big data would be being received. On the other hand, I mean, we still didn't get the answer why we had those problems, why we cannot, okay, just to recreate what we've done. And I spending sleepless nights trying to figure it out where I put the node, how I run the calculation, right? And the, blaming myself, okay, maybe that's my task management skills, people management skills, I don't know. But the, <laughs> let's say, a relief came when this publication in the uh, posture showed up where the big guys, okay, from the company Agman, they tried to, to recreate 53 landmark studies, okay, following, published already with all the additional material and explanations, and it kind of failed because they only were able to recreate 11% of the studies at that time, stating, okay, that we have a data reproducibility problem. So, and we could sit and we could forget about this. We could have our kitchen talks, you know, like, ah, oh, remember this data receivability, and so I, I don't know how to deal with this, but who cares? Here comes SNL. Those guys, they want to cover themselves. These, are, these guys are funding agencies, and they've been asked really tough questions up above. So definitely, they want to cover themselves. That's why they came up with a data management plan for your SNF plan. Okay, it's still vague, still biased, but lots of, lots of emphasis were put into the things like data reproducibility, okay, data storage uh, calculations you've done, and so on and so on. 
So we had to get ready for this, okay? Because people, as you see, one of the services were grant proposal writing. People were coming to us and asking, what about data management plan? Guys, how can we cover? Could you help us with this? And we had to come up with sort of a solution. I'm not saying that this is the panacea, this is a recipe. This is, I'm saying, I said, this is our story. The way how we, with limited resources, the three of us, okay, and the guys we know, okay, and the guys we work with, okay, from ATH, Basel, Geneva, University of Lausanne, okay, how we sit together and try to at least cover our backs when the FNF comes or the reviewers come. Okay, so, and we were not alone, okay? People, definitely this is not the new topic, and people, some research groups, okay, trying to tackle it, slowly applying or somehow describing their vision on what data reproducibility should be and how it can be achieved hypothetically or how can it be achieved by the data management and so on. So there are a few papers, really interesting ones and really top journals were describing how, okay, those research groups, they see the data reproducibility. But this is a personal vision, once again, right? So you can pick it up, you can trust it, right? But on the other hand, is it the final institution where you go? Is it written by someone, okay, all of those guidelines, are they written by someone who knows how the science is done in a proper way? Okay, so this publication, was kind of a saver for us because these professors they know how to do proper science and how to annotate how to prepare so you are good in terms of the at least some kind of uh, data reproducibility so they come up with sort of uh, the guidelines what you can use okay when describing to people what is the data reproducibility so we definitely cannot cover all of them Okay, with going with GOR numbers and the, when you push your publication and you push your data set in the public repository, no, we don't do this. But at least what we can do, we can be sure or somehow that we can cover like data analysis side, right? From the data generation to the plot creation. And these are the highlights. They say data should be shareable, software should be shareable, workflows should be somehow shareable. Okay, and all details of your computations should be stored, okay, along with the environment where they're being done. Okay, and potentially also put in a, a shareable repository. Then persistent links should appear to the published articles and so on, so the additional material should be linked to the, uh, uh, to the, to the own calculations what were done and the data being received. So we use this as a ground truth and try to come up with something. So, and the something is now called iPortal. Right? That has a long story. The name has a long story starting at the Rudy Zabrzod lab, but uh, we started talking to the guys from the ATH in Basel, from the APFL, talking, asking their questions. So what would you, how do you deal with this? What do you do particularly? So first of all, and the first and the, 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 uh, one of the most important suggestions what they give us, you have to get rid, guys, of the needle of the commercial tools. User friendliness is pleasant. It's a pleasure, it's tempting, but it will bite you like hell, okay? Whenever you do, whenever you need to update, whenever you need to develop, you will spend time and help talking to them, guys, and you will pay. You will pay a lot. So, yeah, we bite our okay, bullet and decided to, okay, to come with a list of three open source, okay, solutions for different tasks what we apply towards our data. So the first one is the OpenBIS, is a data management platform developed by the ATH Zurich. Now it's been for 10 years of really heavy funding of OpenBIS, and OpenBIS becomes the, data, the central data management platform at the ATH. Moreover, OpenBIS was taking as a data management platform for a new development of the ATH called Leonard Med. I think that some people here know what Leonard Med is all about and how they, and how you can access to this. Uh, so now OpenBIS will be your interface with uh, Leonard Med. So, and we decided since uh, uh, we worked with uh, ATH guys and OpenBIS guys a lot in the past, we decided to give it a try. 
So that was used for the, to manage data, to annotate and to manage and to take data directly from the either users or the instruments. Then we need to have a solution, okay, for our software. When you develop the pipeline, you need to have a solution for your tools. And with this, we went out with a singularity. So singularity, it's a, I mean, uh, it's not a new topic. It's all about the, if I spell it correctly, dockerization. So you can imagine, uh, yes, it recalls you the name docker, right? So docker containers and singularity containers mostly doing the same. But for us, there's a really important difference. That's about technical details. When you run, as, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but when you use Docker, okay, Docker makes you a root. And in order to use uh, Docker, you need to be a root. Which means you cannot bring a Docker on a central system used and shared among other users because you can do really messy stuff, right? So if you're a root, you can do everything. So not many, not many teams, okay, running or having the local infrastructure would like to go with a Docker, right, for the for the containerization of the workloads, right. So that's why the guys developed the singularity, and that singularity container gives you the opportunity to be you, to be yourself. You don't have to go with the root, which means uh, user permissions and user management it's totally and much better and really simplified with singularity. So Singularity, what we pack into Singularity are the tools what we use, okay, along with the, the script what we have for our workflow. So you can recall, or you can call, I call it personally Singularity, singularity Dockers, I call them the time capsules, right? Because you pack tools, you, you know exactly version what you've been using, you know what you apply, you test every tool, and you put your script inside of Singularity container. So you have your time capsule for the data sets what you analyze on that particular day asked by that particular time. So this is the workflow part. But now, since we have an opportunity to use those computational resources, right, we needed a tool which would allow us to go with high performance computing, parallelized computing, okay, it's scalable computing. That's why we use GC3Pi. This is Repi is a suite of the Python classes developed by S380 guys, so at least we didn't have to pay for them, right? So just for submitting and controlling the bad jobs for the when you run when you run them on the cluster or the grid resources, and we have both. So this is what we use to control our jobs, okay? And the final point, when you analyze your data, when you uh, you would like to visualize the results, and you would like to do additional analysis. And for this, we used Jupyter Notebooks, which is an open source web application, right, allowing you to interact with your code, okay, live, update your plots live, run additional simulators live, okay, save it and then share with others via the Jupyter Notebook file. So these are four components what we had in the iPortal. So to represent it graphically, Right, you have an open with data mover, the plugin which sucks data out of the of the machinery, either microscopy, mass spectrometer, or NGS, puts on your storage, as SRAT we also provide storage solutions, right? And make it available for the biologists, bioinformaticians, and modelers for the data management, for the data processing, okay, and the data visualization. So this is sort of a simplified view of the of the whole platform. Now let's go into the details. So when developing, while developing uh, iPortal, we also had our goals and also our guidelines. So definitely, okay, and you know it, the base of the users and the customers what we have in terms of the knowledge of bioinformatics, computational biology and programming at all, okay, is quite different. You have totally self-sufficient guys to whom you just give access to the cloud and he builds slum cluster, he runs high performance computing parallelization, he runs by Hydra Esther by themselves, even in biology. And we have those to whom switching on, switching off of the computer, you are good. Wow. So 
definitely we need to provide also the sweet work user friendliness, right? So we needed to have a web-based platform, okay, which would be easy to use and user friendly. So for us, what was most important is to retain data in the long term, but in an unchangeable way. Once pushed directly from the machinery, okay, or from the uh, uploaded by, by the user, the data should be labeled, given a unique identifier, so I know precisely when it was generated, by whom, under what conditions. So the workflows should be reproducible, insurable. The, mm, the reports and the results should be linked back to the input data, and the reports or the analysis can be downloadable, updated, and basically pushed back and linked to the original data and the result generated before. So these were the guidelines giving, which we received talking directly to the users, right? We generated the online form, right, where we asked for one month, what, how would you envision, what you would like to have, and so on. So this is sort of a cluster, right, of the answers and how they will see this, right? So, Starting with that, okay, we had we had our developments going and so on and so on, right? And the, we split it, okay, and subcategorized those uh, uh, those guidelines into four steps. First of all, and the most important part for the user is I want to get rid of the data. I have data sitting under my desktop, okay, or my sitting data in the functional genomic core facilities. They are calling me up, right? I need to get rid of. Do I have a place? Do I have a quick way just to upload the data? Right? Okay, so but that wasn't developed. This came up just simply recently. We call it the simplified data upload, which is the application which allows you, okay, just simply copy and paste your data, right, and put into this into this window with minimum annotations, which you okay find helpful, okay, for further uh, for further usage. And it will be uploaded into OpenBIS. It will go to the special place, okay, called staging, right, which will be dedicated towards the user. So the user only see what data he uploaded before. And this is sort of, I mean, I cannot think of a simpler way. You just simply copy and paste. For the heavy load, okay, we also use in-browser, okay, application, which allows you to upload the data sets up to 12 gigabytes of size, and we use the data mover, okay, it's not recommended, it's been tested, so it was, uh, uh, I, I, could, I could push uh, the data set of the size 12 gigabytes. But for big data sets, we recommend to go with the, with the OpenBIS data mover, which is a Python plugin, also open source, developed by the ATH guys, allowing you to tune it to the level that it can be either getting data from the user, because the user will get the data open this data mover server, so he will be uploading data there, or the data mover will be getting data from either the functional genomic core facility or from the machinery in the lab. So when data is uploaded into OpenBIS, the next what we ask, and we also train how to do this, they say, let's annotate your data. Okay, don't leave it like this. Let's represent your study. So within the six months, the six months, you know what you've been doing, okay? Every single PhD student, every single postdoc, he runs one or multiple projects. So let's bring them all together. Let's represent the study, describe the experiments, describe the samples, and link the data sets which you've just uploaded to under those samples. So at the end, okay, with a simple, simple metadata model, which uses only five attributes, spice, experiment, space, project, experiment, sample, and data set. You have your study represented inside of OpenBIS. So this is screenshot. This is experiment view mode. So this is the ID of the experiment with some meta information, okay, on what type of cells, when we generated, the number of cells. Along with this, you have all samples belonging to this experiment, right? biological and the technical ones, towards which you apply sentence SOP, standard operational procedure, right? You analyze 
with certain methodology or technology, NGS, mass spec, or a microscope, and you got your data sets, which you uploaded before. So this is step number two. You got your data uploaded, and you got your data represented. You don't have to go with a really complex metadata model, all right? Few experiments, few samples, just for you to let you know what you've been doing. So when you're coming, running into our office six months later, saying, I remember I sent you that Excel file in the email. Right? You said, no, sorry, I don't want to remember this. Okay? I want to remember the names of my kids. Okay, I already swapped them. Okay, I want to remember. So this is a platform. Tell me what, the, what is the ID of the sample. Tell me what is the ID of the data set. And I will do my analysis for you. You don't want me to do this for you, so let's still build a workflow for you, right? So, uh, what kind of workflow would you like, right? Because the OpenBase, why that was the major, major decision on OpenBase. Definitely, you can come up with other tools, B2B, Seek, okay, uh, Lapkey, and so on and so forth. But none of them, none of them gives you the possibility, okay, and the and the the usability to be changed and to bring additional changes into this, like OpenBase. Plus, you got OpenBase developers sitting like a 200 meter screen, so why, why bother? So OpenBase, within the OpenBase, we provide the workflows, customized workflows for uh, our users. To build the workflow, we have a series of, uh, we have a, a series of meetings where we sit together and they, try to describe to me what they've been doing. What, and what kind of data they've been getting, what they did do the data, what kind of tools they've been running, right, under what parameters, and what they want at the end. But usually at the end, okay, what they want is not what functional genomic core facilities give them, because functional genomic core facilities give you an Excel file, right? And then you have the, and then it's up to you to figure it out, which is down-regulated, up-regulated, not regulated, right? what the researcher wants. He wants to have a map plot. He wants to have volcano plot, right? He wants to see the outlier, not on a, PG, not on a PDF format like functional genomic world sends you, right? He wants to see, have a mouse over, right, opportunity, and to get the gene ID. Oh, I know the gene, oh, that's an artifact, that makes sense. Okay, so this interactivity comes later with Jupyter, but before this, we have to run the workflow. So within the open base, we use a JavaScript, to develop those small apps, right, which take you through a few steps, okay, in order to analyze your data. We ask you what data set you want to analyze, okay, against what we call a database, but let's say genome you want to align to. Then what kind of parameters do you want to apply towards those tools? Tools being discussed already with our consultancy and with their, I mean, preferences, there are many, Okay, guys, having their own preferences built, not not their experience, but the papers they read before because they were cited in IT top journals, right? So that that was that's another story, right? So parameters and the final page, which is a summary of everything what we collected before, with an opportunity then just to submit it to the backend. So for you to understand. This information, what user provides, okay, is stored in the any file, on the configuration file. And what OpenBit does, we never run something on the OpenBit backend. No, never. OpenBit sends this any file to the cluster, what we have on the cloud system, right? So the any file, okay, comes and is read by the 363 pi, okay, which starts downloading, okay, data sets, starts downloading the genome and starts applying the parameters to the tools which actually are stored and run within the Singularity container. And then initiate the workflow uh, written in the Singularity file which is stored in the Singularity container. I know that many guys can ask me, so you store data sets in the Singularity container. You stay your genomes in no, we don't do this. We store data sets separately. They've been downloaded when the singularity container needs to be run. So we don't, st if we store, we store some small, small data sets, but no the big ones, no the, never input file and the genomes. Then GC3Pi 
reading the, the, what should be done, orchestrates okay, the scalability of the code and the workflow on the either Vesta, Hydra, on the or cloud computer. When the workflow is finished, the results are uploaded automatically back into OpenBIS for further analysis and the visualization with Jupyter Notebooks. So this is a description how the workflow runs. So a bit of information on the result. So usually the result is totally coordinated with the request coming from the user. He says, it says, NGS, I don't need BAM files, but I would like to have a big VIG files. And with big VIG files, I would like to have also the bad files and the HTC metrics written in the TXT format. Can you deliver to me in one big data set along with, along with all plots, Jupyter Notebook so I can update and create additional plots, and the singularity container, so I can send to my client, to my to my colleague somewhere in, in Basel, so he can rerun it. Ah, all right. Okay, so we try to come up, okay, with this kind of final output. So here you see the report, written HTML, just for the visualization, so they see if the work, workflow worked at all. Maybe it was a complete bullshit, and they don't need this, so they can rerun it, or call us, to figure out what's going on. They have a Jupyter container and they have the bunch of files what they asked for from BAM, TXT, HTC, Refrix, Seek, whatever they want, plus plot. So taking a look at the HTML plot, with the right, uh, a little bit of imagination, okay, and tricks coming from the JavaScript, we tried into the HTML plot, specifically in my case, the users are asking, so can you rerun every single time, 100%, can you rerun the quality check? Because kinda kinda interesting the quality check from the functional genomic core facilities, right? So when we know the tool of the choice for the NGS data is FastQ, and when you run the FastQC, it generates a bunch of data and so on and so on. So guys been taking this problem and they created really excellent tool, love it. It's called MultiQC, which is sort of a cluster. It consolidates every HTML report generated by FastQC and gives you an opportunity to be, okay, even if they're active. So it's totally mouse over. You start, okay, with the beginning from the sequencing scores and ending up with the with additional plots at the KMERS, GC content, etc. So it's already inside of OpenBase. So you don't have to go, okay, and open another folder, write another email. That's already here just, okay, for your usage. Along with this, okay, along with this, and sitting together and discussing, once again, at the kitchen or at the happy hours with the researcher, they say, Rossi, that would be nice to have, you know, this mad plot. Can you give it to me? Because I've been asking the functional genomic guys, because they give it to me. They give me in a, they give me in a, in a, in a, in a PDF format. I would like to have it sort of a HTML. I would like to have it interactive. Can you give it to me? Okay, let's try to do this. So, and we come up with a list of the plots, what they're asking, right? I mean, and what I could do from my side. So it can be from the simple Volcano plot, some simple heat maps. So I'm not talking about the really advanced, okay, clustering and the PCH, no. Just, the, we, we operate here, I would say, okay, in the terms of like a startup, deliver fast and often. Right, so those mostly startups they operate this. They the 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 possibility of running the infrastructure, the prices what uh, I mean the affordable prices, okay, making it possible to rerun the application whenever times you are whenever time you okay. If you find these results tricky, let's rerun it under different parameters. Let's apply this, this, and this. So don't wait, don't go because I've been talking to the guys and they're still in 2018 running every single tool manually. And you know what they say? They say, why are you doing this? I'm doing this because I have my quality check, visual quality check. They say, but you're wasting your time. Why not to run it once, okay, in an accelerated way? You will get, you will get at the end, the answer, if your experiment work or not, if it's valuable or not. So we are trying to operate in this kind of uh, domain. So with a list of, uh, uh, possible plots which came from the user 
we provide that report. So that's about the HTML file, what you can have. Along with the report in HTML format and a bunch of files, what they ask for, we provide the Jupyter notebook file. So all plots, what I showed you before, okay, were generated within Jupyter notebook. So, and this notebook file was saved and put back. So if they, so, which means the user can download the file, okay, and start working on this. Extending my work, not calling me, can you do this for me, right? But simply taking this to the next level. You have the collection of the data, and you have everything what is needed for the Jupyter to work. You're in the same folder, you open this, you download it, and you start updating, okay, with additional with additional functions or additional visualization. So when you finish that and you are happy with your results, you can, one said, save that Jupyter notebook and upload it back into OpenDesk. The system will ask you, where do you want to upload it? So your task is say, right? I want to link it to the raw data and the results from which I got the report. So you basically have the whole sequence now. You started with raw data, which were uploaded by, okay, the, uh, from the machine or by the user. You annotated your data in your preferable way. You run the workflow. You got the report, and you have an ability, okay, to work and to continue your work, not maybe on the raw data, but let's say HTC generated matrices. Right? And you start digging, digging more, getting the out -re uh, up regulated genes, down regulated genes. Okay? You can transfer with Jupyter Notebook. Okay? You are simply unlimited because that works in R. It has R kernel, it has Python, it has R, uh, MATLAB, anything. C, C++, Java. Everything is possible for Jupyter Box. And it's open source. Get it from the GitHub, okay? from the Jupyter GitHub, and you will be Okay, it will install either on a local computer or on the server. So, once again, I described to you how it works, at least behind, with this system, or with this kind of approach, not really, but a much better night's sleep, right? Because at least I can be sure, not 100%, but I can be happier, 90%, that if someone will knock on my door and ask, listen, remember we did something one year ago or six months ago? Do you remember that? I will be able to answer yes, maybe. Let's take a look. Right. So, and following the guides, guidelines from this publication, we believe that in our at least data reproducibility understanding, we have four major components which should be the in synergy. First of all, Data, okay? Data should be downloaded. Data should be annotated. Your data set cannot be changed. And your data sh set should be accessible, okay? And shareable. And to cover those tasks, we're using OpenDesk. Software. Software should be discussed with the researcher directly. I have cases where I thought that I knew what they've been doing and they what they want, and I were wrong. I have to confess. I used different tools which generated total different results, and I didn't tell them. Okay. Then we find out that, aha, uh -huh, right? We had our endless meetings, and then we find out that tool that was a particular tool producing those results. Right? They wanted different. So whenever workflow you have to bring in. It should be discussed with the researchers. It's better to invest, okay, three good meetings and to come up with a list of tools and the parameters because they know, many of them, they know what they've been doing and what kind of uh, analysis they're going to run. So you have to discuss. It should be tested, containerized, saved, and also shareable. And the singularity, okay, having a singularity container, right, you can easily, or singularity image, you can easily download it and share with the with your colleague, because you save the environment. You do the time snapshot, okay, for the environment, your computational environment. Then the workflows. Once again, along with software, 
It should be discussed in direct contact with the researchers. It should be universal in terms of the language which you use, right? Everyone has their own preferable language, Perl, Python, or MATLAB. Okay, so it should be should be universal. It should be scalable and preferably annotated in the I mean in a more or less good way, so you know what this is all about and uh, what you what you've been doing. Talking about the scalability, right? So it should be applicable on the GPU clusters, on the high memory machines, and potentially cloud computing, along with, okay, we are still keeping this in mind because still we have sort of a conservative way of doing research. I buy my own infrastructure. I have a server behind, under my desk, and that's, okay, keeps me safe. So for this, we use G GCC Pi. And finally, data visualization. So I believe personally that in the data annotation and the data visualization in the area of big data, okay, are really crucial things. Because what good it does to you, right, if your data is not annotated? You can have terabytes of data, but it is not labeled. You cannot use it, right? So at least for I mean, machine learning, you need annotated data. So annotations should be provided. And finally, people. And I think this is because of the area of uh, social media. The people got used to the data visualization. They don't want to read. They want to see it, right? And they want to, through the vision, the, the understanding comes now. So for data visualization, we use uh, Jupyter because it gives us interactivity, right? Users can interact with the code directly. Okay, feeling strong enough, brave enough, type in your code and start, I mean, come on. You are not the first one doing this. Forums, okay, Google Groups, are packed by a start, packed with examples. So that's why they are not eager, they are so eager to try. So this interactivity comes with Jupyter. It should be universal, depending on your preferable language, right? It should be, Jupyter Notebook should be linked to the original results, to so the raw data, and it should be sort of shareable. So all this together in a sort of a sequence, okay, makes us life easier in terms of data reproducibility when that question comes from other customers. And it comes quite often. <laughs> so but a little bit of numbers. Uh, so everything, everything then boils down to the numbers. So as for now, we have, uh, I mean, we have 145 active users. We've been running this business since 2000, uh, well, since the first instance was generated, 2015. And I'm talking about the central instance. I'm talking about the case where we install OpenBase, and this is a quite different from the model run by the ATH, where they try to come up with a separate instance for each research group. Okay, in our case, we don't have this leverage. That's why we install this on the one central instance packed with storage, okay, where users can basically uh, profit because been using this system, okay, they've been developing the metadata models. And please believe me, there's some overlap of the models like sample types, experiment types, properties, conditions what they use. So they found this quite interesting. Okay, if the new things should be developed, they, we, we can bring it in. So those users cover, as you could guess, yeah, mostly the University of Zurich, different departments, molecular, uh, mol uh, I mean, and those guys, we have, we have users really, really advanced programmers, advanced bioinformaticians, so what they need, they still need, we need just simply one component of the system. We need either data management, or can you help us develop the singularity container? Or can you can you run can you help us to run GC3 Pi and make it scalable for for the for our cluster what we generate? Or can you can you give me access or build me a Jupyter a hub cluster? Or and we have cases where let's say with Institute I put it the first one because Department of Molecular Mechanism or Disease is our pilot, okay, it's our pride because they've been using everything. They've been using the whole system. They've been running the workflows along with others, but they were the first ones, okay, and the ones heavily, heavily testing the system. So uh, also we have collaborators from the University of Spital Zurich, 
and other departments. MS for now, we have approximately 11,000 samples registered, 23,000 data sets. Until now, we executed altogether 412 workflows. So those workflows, if you ask me, they don't think, don't go, don't think too complicated things. We call the workflows some kind of data processing stuff, right? Let's say, can you do the quality check? Can you do, can you do, can you run sort me RNA? Okay, for me. Can you, can you do trimming? Or can you, can you link all of these three together and then I will do it the, the rest by myself? The workflows and the others, like RNA-seq developed by us, where we taking data from the functional genomic work facility, putting on open bits, annotating them according to the, uh, to the sheet set by, by the user, then launching the workflows and generating the results. Okay. And others, as I said, depending on their needs. It's all about the discussions, all about the collaboration. So this is what worked for us. And we will try to keep on, keep on doing this. So special thanks to my colleagues, especially Dr. Lars Malmström, who was the one who came up with, uh, with this vision, and he received this vision at the Rudi Zabrzog lab, okay, at the ATH, right, where the open base was used from the beginning, 2000, uh, 2010, okay, and that's the lab uh, where they had at that moment five mass spectrometers running 24 hours seven, and they were looking for the solution, okay, just for the data management and for the data analysis. Okay, I'm really grateful to the SRAT team for all their input. Our director, Maestro Riedi, Rafaela Santoro, Vendrin, okay, the director of CIS team at the ATH, and the professor, Michael Fortigan, okay, who also uh, is a big fan of uh, our system. Thank you very much, guys, and thank you those online. I hope you found all found this talk interesting.